So we're back to English now, and well, you're here. So Toto Ellis from Droga 5, please. Bonjour, ça va? In French, anyway. <laughs> That's all you get. Um, right, uh, so interestingly, Mark Adams, who was on earlier, is a good friend of mine. Um, his company is now 100% owned by William Morris Endeavour. And interestingly, William Morris Endeavour took a 49% stake in our agency, uh, Droga 5, last year. So it's part of a sort of drive to essentially create a network of influence. Let's begin with uh, we want to build influential brands. So we actually work very closely with Mark, and I have a lot of sort of synergy with what Mark will say, actually. Um, so I think I was asked to talk about how to catapult brands uh, into culture. And my first piece of advice is absolutely do not catapult brands into culture because uh, they will crash into culture uh, and cause uh, devastation and annoyance to everyone. Uh, I think the important thing about a brand going into culture is actually it has to walk very slowly and very gently and very carefully into culture. Uh, I guess a lot of you in this room are marketeers, but you're also consumers of culture. It might be film culture, food culture, mixology culture, fashion culture, and I think you'd agree that when you're enjoying culture, you don't necessarily want a brand coming along and interfering in those passions. So I'm going to talk about how brands can play a role in culture, and I'm going to use quite a few examples from our agency, uh, and I hope you don't mind, because sometimes the best way of explaining this is just to show the kinds of things we do, and then I'll explain some of the thinking behind them, and then you can ask me questions about them. But I've put a little bit of theory in there, but really I'm going to lead through examples. So just to sort of say who we are, uh, agency credentials are very boring, so I've just got one slide. Uh, with three offices, uh, New York is the biggest, and it's kind of the mothership, there's over 300 people there. Uh, Australia, for a very strategic reason that Dave Droger, the founder, is from Australia. And uh, London, because it's very important these days, uh, a lot of clients want a global hub in London, and Britain is a great market for creative work. Uh, and we were founded between the years that Facebook and Twitter were founded. So we always like to say we were born digitally native. We've never drawn up digital divisions. We were just born as a company in a digital age. So everyone in the company is tasked with being digital, strategic, and creative. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Why, why earn a place in culture? Why bother? And then four things that I think are important if a brand wants to earn a role in culture. The first thing is to have a sense of purpose. The second is... Actually, if you're going to go into culture, you need to go and speak to experts, people that already operate within those cultures. The third thing I'm going to talk about is the possibility of when you want to partner with influencers in culture, which is something we do quite a lot. And this is not about just shoving a celebrity in an ad, sometimes it is, but it's actually about creating things with influencers. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about this, th this phrase I like to use, which, is called, which I say, take the luck out of fame. You can't hope to be famous. Uh, clients often say, you know, can we make a viral? And I think Google calculated that one in, I think it's one in 4,000 videos that have the intention of going viral actually go viral. So those are very, very, oops, excuse me. Those are very poor odds on, uh, on an idea going viral. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to wireframe influence uh, into ideas. So why should a brand earn a place in culture? Well, this is the problem, really, is, you know, marketing strategy certainly was, I guess, invented in the 1960s. It was a time when, I guess, in Britain there was one, I'm not even sure there was then, but there was one commercial television channel. Uh, and it was very easy, really, to, to advertise to people because they were watching one of one commercial channels and they were reading a few commercial titles. And so these sort of terminologies have built up in our industry. Can we be best in class, best in break, best in category? Can we be awards worthy, which sadly means at an advertising festival in Cannes? Uh, can we cut through past other advertising? And can we beat the competition? And the problem with these phrases, they're very self-reflective. They're about our industry. Are we the best of the ad break? Well, the problem is, as we all know, people might not be watching the ad break. So what's the point being the best in a thing that people aren't necessarily watching anymore? And also, that's not really how consumers leave their lives. Consumers leave their lives surrounded by culture, popular culture, all the things they're interested in. And I can't make that square small enough. It should be smaller. Uh, and then there's some of the advertising that surrounds them. And it's such a tiny little part of their life. 
And in fact, ideally, they'd live without it. Um, and so at Droga 5, we, we look at this much more expansive canvas to paint on. It's much more exciting as a brand when you say, where in the whole of the culture surrounding an audience could I go, versus do I want to be the best ad? Now, we're not anti-advertising at Droga 5. We make lots of ads. Ads are often the answer. But there's just a more expansive way of looking when you say, where in culture could I go? Particularly when you know these numbers. Does anyone want to have a guess at what the 89% number means? It's about advertising. Anyone have a guess? So in the UK, 89% of advertising is forgotten. <laughs> right? Terrifying. Not necessarily instantly, but I think this number means sort of within 24 hours. Uh, given that you were probably hit by several thousand advertising messages yesterday, how many do you remember? Chances are you've forgotten 89%. What about the 7%? What do we think that is? Anyone brave enough to have a guess? Recall. What's that? Recall. Recall. Yes, recalled and not liked. 7% <laughs> of advertising is remembered and disliked. Now, in some ways, it's better to be a client with an a bit of advertising here than here, perhaps. You know, those ads that really annoy you for insurance aggregators might just work. Um, and that leaves 4% of advertising that is remembered positively. Now, that's in the UK. I don't know what the number is here, but I suspect it isn't that different. So that's quite terrifying, isn't it? That means, you know, all of us working long hours in the office while other people are saving lives doing advertising, it, you know, it's quite terrifying that 96% of our efforts are wasted. 96% of our day is a waste of time, if you believe that statistic. Um, so every 100 people we talk to, imagine that's the population of uh, Geneva or Switzerland or your advertising campaign, boom, that's how many remember it and that's how many like it. That's a bit scary. It's particularly scary when we spend so much money on it. $545 billion on something that's mainly forgotten. Um, so really what I'm going to talk about today is that cultural resonance is key. Whether the answer is an ad, and you want to be in the 4%. And uh, by the way, often an a piece of advertising is the answer. And I will show you some of our adverts today. But it's got to be culturally resonant. It shouldn't feel like advertising. It should feel like a piece of cultural content. Otherwise, why would I spend time with it? Or to play elsewhere in the culture, elsewhere on that canvas. Cultural resonance is key. And I'm just going to show you now an ad just to prove we're not anti-advertising. This is an ad for Hennessy. Uh, Hennessy's sort of brand purpose is around this, brand platform is around this idea of never stop, never settle. We stand for people who never stop, never rest on their laurels. They're always achieving and seeking more. And this was the ad we made. I should say this is now as a rapper. To, early yeah. times, to the New York state of mind. The city never sleeps, full of villains and that up a bit. That's where I learned to do my hustle, had to scuffle with freaks. Each block is like a maze, maze. And life is parallel to hell, but I must maintain and be prosperous. Though we look dangerous. It's only right that I was born to use mics. Y'all ready for now? So that's an ad, uh, and it got, I can't remember how many million views, but it's an ad, but it feels like a piece of content. You know, when David, the founder of our company, showed me that, I said, that sort of could be a short film, could be a music video, and it happens to say something about the product. But it does it by actually saying something about the audience. We're for people who never stop, never settle. So I want to get out of the way. Advertising can be perfectly good, uh, but most of it doesn't get noticed. So our goal at uh, Droga5 is effectiveness. It's because we're a very creatively led company, led by David Droga, who's a creative individual. A lot of people think there isn't a lot of strategy uh, wireframed into our ideas. There's a relentless amount of strategy that goes on before the creative process, and a relentless amount of measurement that goes on to ensure we're effective. But our route to effectiveness we call influence. The definition being the capacity or power to be a compelling force. So what we say is we exist to build and sustain the most influential businesses and brands of the 21st century. It sounds a bit grand, but importantly it's a statement not about ourselves, but our clients. We want brands that become influential. And whether that brand be Barack Obama, uh, who we did some stuff for at his original election campaign, or be that brand be a cognac or a pair of trainers. 
And to be influential, we just think you've got to see culture, not just as the opportunity, but actually as the competitive set. Uh, and also uh, the, the, the canvas, the canvas on which to paint ideas. So what we think is, can we be as interesting as all the culture going on in people's lives? Not, can we be the most interesting piece of marketing material? And you may or may not be familiar with some of these ideas, but I'll touch on them later, but this is Puma. Being, this was Beyonce kicking off an idea for the United Nations. This is where he pretended to graffiti Air Force One uh, and let 18 million people believe it, including news outlets in America, until we revealed it actually was a, a stunt for Mark Echo. Uh, and this is Athenus. Uh, this is a very grumpy Greek grandmother who represents the Athenus uh, brand of products. So we try to think, how can we be culturally resident? How can we create something that people want to spend time with? David, our founder, is a very laid-back Australian. His definition when he's in creative reviews is, why would I give a shit? You know, genuinely, we actually, in creative reviews, say, why would people give a shit? Will they give a shit about this piece of content or not? So, my first uh, piece of advice, and certainly what we do, is to have purpose. Now, it might sound like semantics, but to have purpose is incredibly different than having a positioning or having a message. Most brands today still have a position, the position they want to occupy in the market and in your mind, or they have a message. And the problem with a message is a message is generally a message about themselves, and it's generally one way. It doesn't let me interact with it. Strong brands have purpose. There are different words. You could say belief, behavior. We use purpose. What is the purpose of this brand in people's lives? Because where we are lucky for those eight of us agency side is we often represent phenomenal products. You know, Hennessy is a phenomenal product. Prudential is a phenomenal financial services provider. Puma are amazing uh, sportswear products. We represent great brands, so how can we then translate that to say what our role is in people's lives, not a message about our product? What's different about a purpose? The first thing is it's a promise. It's a sense of we promise to do this for you. We promise to offer this to you as a brand, not please buy our product. The second thing about a purpose is it always, always, always should involve the brand and the audience. Where most brands fall short is they have a statement that is only about the product and not about what it does for me. And I will show you a whole bunch of examples in a minute to make this more clear. Uh, the third thing is it should be a promise of action. You know, it's no coincidence that most of our brand purposes, or her pie, whatever the plural of purposes, most of our purposes have a verb in. There's a sense of doing something for people, not just saying. And the problem is when you say is you can't go into culture if you just want to, just want to speak at people. Uh, but you can when you have purpose. And the final thing I'd say, and someone said to me, <laughs> Swiss culture isn't very generous, but I'd encourage you as brands to, to be generous. Brands have to be prepared to give of themselves to other people, not simply to ask. Back to Mark's sort of bank that he talked about. Um, brands have to be prepared to be generous. And how we get to a brand purpose, I won't really tell you, but I'll certainly tell you that we go into these four boxes. We say, what is the most differentiating area of our company or brand? Who is the consumer and what can we understand about them? Where in the category can we own a unique space? And we spend a lot of time here understanding what would drive influence in the context of brand. What is interesting in culture at the moment that we can ride on as a brand? So these are some of our brand purposes, and hopefully you'll notice in them that they all have that sense of action, that sense of a promise, that sense of generosity. So Prudential is an interesting one. I'm going to show you a case study. Because traditionally, financial service providers really do talk about themselves. Their products, you know, in the UK, we have Lloyd's TSB for the journey. We're there for you for life. You know, the world's local bank. They're very much statements about themselves, whereas this is a very generous statement. At Prudential, we want to make America financially smarter. We want to make the whole of America become more savvy about their money. And in doing so, of course, we have the products to serve that. Hennessy is about realizing potential. Uh, Under Armour, I'll talk, talk about later, their brand purpose is to empower women on their terms. Um, and then when we get a brand purpose, we then shift across to what we call a platform. A platform is not an idea or an advertising idea. It's a platform off which ideas can spring, be they advertising, be they products, or be they services. So these are some of the brand platforms we have for our brands. For Prudential, the, the platform is Bring Your Challenges. Uh, for Hennessy, you saw there, never stop, never settle. Radox in the UK, uh, the brand purpose is about how do you want to feel? It's about mood and fragrance. Uh, it's quite an unusual one. Newcastle's brand per, uh, platform is no bollocks. Uh, I'll explain right at the end why that is, but it's because the American beer market is, is, is full of overclaim and overpromise, uh, and, and you'll see that later. Honeymade is just a, a, a graham cracker. <laughs> it's a little biscuit in America, but the platform is this is wholesome. And Under Armour is I will what I want. That's the line. So, Prudential, I said they want to make America financially smarter. The other good thing about a good brand purpose is it almost has a sense of an end goal that we might never achieve. 
something that's so kind of lofty that we might spend years getting there. We're clearly not going to make the whole of America financially smarter, but if we're restless in our ambition to try and make America financially smarter, that feels a very generous thing to do. In the same way Nike says, if you have a body, you're an athlete. It's clearly not true, but that drives their brand, that sense that we all have athletic potential, that belief. So I'll now show you something. We, came, we got a brief at Prudential. Uh, Prudential came to us and said, we want to uh, push pensions to retirees. And typically what you do, of course, is show a yacht or a, a golf club or a sort of perfect uh, home with a white picket fence and some sort of model 60-year-olds and, and talk about you know, how we're there for your retirement and everything's going to be great. Uh, and no one really connects with it. So instead, this is what we did. It's kind of hard to make decisions by yourself all of a sudden when you've been making them with somebody else for 35 years. I don't know how much money I need, but I know that whatever I have, that's what I'm going to live within. Time went by fairly fast. It goes by too, too fast. Solid. Stable. Prudent. The values at the heart of Prudential's 135-year history were once a badge of confidence, but had come to symbolize a dusty, bookish institution buried deep inside a rock. We knew that in order to rebuild relevance, we'd need to give a human face to one of the most pressing challenges Americans face, retirement. So we set out to find the real face of retirement. It's not this. It's not luxury vacations yachts, or salt and pepper models we've been shown for years. It's regular people trying to make sense of the end of 45 years of work and retiring into the worst economic crisis in generations, but still full of hope for what can come next. This is day one. Every day, 10,000 people retire. So we began day one by showing one day in America we set up a hundred cameras and followed one sunrise across the country. Then, we asked people to document their very first day of retirement. The thousands of photos we received became the core of the Day One website. Next, we sent camera crews across America and created 19 documentaries about how people really felt on Day One. They shared their lives. I have three daughters and my son and 11 grandkids. Right when you see them, they're yours. It's like, it's part of me. It's me again. And their wisdom. He said, with marriage, when you start out, you take the woman and you get in a boat. He said, then sometimes it might get a little choppy. He said, sometimes it might get very choppy. If there's enough love, stay in the boat. Their stories became TV and radio commercials. And we even turned New York's most prominent billboards into radio stations. So those on their way to work could hear stories from those who just finished a lifetime of work. My father, he had taught me plumbing, electric. All my other brothers went into building and owning houses. But <laughs> I just fell in love with ballet. We then translated these stories into a B2B context for Prudential Retirement, creating a day one retirement sales kit that was instrumental in the company's win of the $1 billion MGM Resorts business. The work created a 148% lift in awareness of our retirement mission and outperformed all category norms for consideration. Among the key financial advisor audience, Day One lifted all key consideration drivers by as much as 31%. But ultimately, Day One meant Prudential could step down from the rock and create the most viewed and most talked about campaign in the category's history. Day one, first day I've never had to answer to anybody for anything, <laughs> except Deacon. <laughs> So the brief, as you can see, was to make them stand for something and to make them resonate with the retiree audience. But the answer was to try and create culturally resonant content and generous content that actually helped retirees understand what retirement's about. It's scary 
and no one really plans for it. Um, and as you saw, in doing so, they lifted to the sort of top of the category in terms of awareness and everything else. So, uh, oh, that title's fallen off. Anyway, so that's my first sort of piece of advice is to have a purpose. You know, if you've got a positioning statement on your desk uh, for a brand that you work for or represent as an agency, it'd be great to look at it again through those eyes. What, what if it was a purpose in people's lives rather than a message <coughs> about ourselves? And the second thing we think is really important is to speak to the creators of culture. Uh, it would be very silly of us to say we can enter a culture that we know nothing about. Uh, and because culture is such a broad canvas, culture is basically everything, um, it kind of helps us to start to break it down. And this is not an exhaustive list. But to just say, what kind of cultures are we fundamentally trying to enter here? You know, are we going into food culture? Are we going into sort of family values, which would be honey made? If we're beats, maybe we're about the intersection of sort of youth um, and music culture. You know, and in fact, a lot of what beats do actually is to go into, into sport culture, interestingly. So what cultures do we want to go and play a role in? And then what we do is call, have a thing called a vision lab, where we get creators of culture in a room. Because ultimately, the culture we consumed in the has in the first place been dreamt up by the creators of that culture. So we'll get journalists, we'll get writers, we'll get uh, artists, we'll get barmen, we'll get whatever it might be that can inform us about the culture we're about to dare to enter for a brand. So we might, rather than speak to, you know, Mintel or Flamingo, two excellent companies, we might talk to James Harding, the head of BBC News in England, and say, what's driving news culture this year? Or Bombus and Parr, two of the most incredible experiential taste experts uh, on the planet. Or Thomas Heatherwick, an amazing architect who designed a lot of London Olympics. Um, and what we ask them is not about trends, because trends are about today. We ask them about their values. What are they thinking about tomorrow? So a lot of the benefit of being within the William Morris Endeavour family is we can find out what Gladwell's thinking about this year, or the author Zadie Smith, or what, what's likely to break in music culture, uh, or youth culture. And so this is an example uh, where we did this for a brand called Under Armour. We actually got these experts in a room. So sportswear marketing to women, this is one of my favourite ever sentences actually, tends to exist of a strategy called shrink it and pink it, right? Get the product, <laughs> a lot of smiling women recognise that, get the product, small it, uh, make it pink, because obviously that's what you want, it's a pink product, and there we go, we've, we've cracked it. Whereas Under Armour wanted to do something a lot more thoughtful. They created a lot more thoughtful range of sporting products designed for women. And so we said, well, how can we resonate with women and talk about sportswear for them? So we talked to a life coach and women's rights activist. You've probably heard of Cindy Gallup, the CEO and founder of Make Love Not Porn. A stand-up comic, you know, we just spoke to lots of different influencers. And from that brand purpose came this creative platform, I Will What I Want. I kind of love lines like, impossible is nothing, I will what I want. They sound a bit weird, because you haven't heard them before. There aren't many words left to put in end lines. But they kind of say something quite profound. I will what I want. And I'm just going to, again, show you another case study of how this then played out. Uh, and again, it's a very thoughtful one, like Prudential. Don't worry, we've got some funny ones as well. But again, a very, very effective campaign. And this, this actually just earned the marketer of the year uh, for this uh, that I'll show you now. Dear candidate, unfortunately, you have not been accepted. You have the wrong body for ballet. In a brand new, much buzzed about campaign from Under Armour, Misty Copeland takes center stage while a young girl's voice reads actual rejection letters she received while starting out. I will what I want. That ad for Under Armour is so powerful. Powerful new ad is going viral right now. Under Armour is probably best known for commercials featuring football players, but now it is using a ballerina to show women can do anything. So far, more than three and a half million views. Five and a half million views. Six million hits on YouTube and counting. The I Will What I Want campaign for Under Armour is so much bigger than myself as an individual. I Will What I Want celebrates all women, defying expectations and ignoring the noise of outside judgments. To build on this, next we signed a woman who was sure to be judged, supermodel Giselle Bündchen. We announced the partnership, and as we anticipated, everyone had something to say online. So we used these real comments in our TV ad. Custom engine scraped the web for comments being made about Giselle. For the first time, the entire social discussion about a single person was happening on one website in real time. New and unique comments were projected, rotoscoped and rendered with every view. 
making it a different experience every single time. Proving Will Beats Noise live. The new face of Under Armour's I Will What I Want campaign, Giselle Bunchen. Will what you want is creating what you want, is not listening to the outside noise and just manifesting what it is that you want in your life. Put what? one leg up. No. Yes! I Will What I Want celebrates women who define success on their terms and made uber masculine Under Armour a symbol of female athletic aspiration. Generating 5 billion media impressions, 20 million dollars in earned media, purchase intent has risen 530%, while traffic is up 42%, and sales are up 26%. It's the most successful campaign in the brand's 16-year history, with a message every woman can make her own. I will what I want. So just such a different approach to sports marketing full stop, but particularly to how to talk to women. And the numbers, again, speak for themselves. I apologise, it's a little bit American, these videos, the way they uh, trot off the results at the end. But um, I, can, you know, I can be proud of it because I didn't work on it. But, but really a phenomenal approach. And the other thing I'd say is, did you notice how many news outlets were talking about those campaigns? It was on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. It was on Breakfast Television. It was in Forbes. It was in The Daily Mail. We always try to talk about ideas that sit at the intersection of influence, sociability, and news. If we're doing our job, a journalist is actually going to write about what we do, which generally doesn't happen. Now, you know, there aren't many times that news outlets want to talk about brands because they're normally selling themselves. But if you do something like this and have a point of view, then they will. Um, so the third, so two lessons so far. Have purpose and talk to people in culture. Honestly, if we hadn't had that panel of experts, I don't think we'd ever have got to this strategy or this line. The next sort of thing I'm going to talk about is, you'll notice actually in, in the last idea we used an influencer, and in Prudential we did not. So we don't certainly put influencers into all ideas, but often we do find that it's relevant to partner with someone, because if you're entering a culture, well, what better thing to do and work with someone that's already in that culture? And this is my model, and it's probably you can't read it there, but what most brands make the mistake of doing is saying, I've already got my thing I want to say, please, celebrity, will you be in it and help champion it? And they go, yes, yeah, sure, that'd be five million pounds, please. And smart brand partnership is where brands listen, right? And go, actually, partner that I want to work with, in this case, I'm going to talk about Jay-Z. What is it you're worrying about this year? Doesn't have to worry about a lot. But he was like, oh, well, I'm launching a book. And then you've got Bing. What are Bing about? Well, they were trying to sort of push their mapping service among a youth audience, right? And then you go, well, what's the talent? So the well, the talent of Jay-Z is he's got an unbelievable following with youth. He's one of the world's best hip-hop and rap artists incredibly influential. Well, what's the talent of Bing? Well, the talent is their amazing mapping product plus their marketing spend. And the idea is to collide these things to come up with something new that's useful or entertaining. So it's not to just make an ad necessarily, or that can be like now, it's, it's can we come up with something together that is useful to the audience or that entertains them, makes them smile, but that sits at the intersection of our talents? of our talents. And a lot of what we do, again, with WME, we're actually, we've actually written a brand purpose for The Rock, by the way, Dwayne Johnson, which is really kind of quite interesting. A lot of what we spend time doing is going, what are you thinking about this year? Because most uh, artists now go into sort of multiple categories. Look at Pharrell, he's in fashion as much as he's in music, as much as he's in Hollywood. So understanding what a brand and an artist have in common and then creating something. So I'll show you this case study. Again, it's only three minutes. It just does it better than I can say it. But this was a collaboration between Jay-Z and Bing. I can't tell you what we paid him, but I can tell you it was a fraction of what you'd have paid him if you'd asked him to be in an ad, because we helped him. Bing, Microsoft's search engine, came to us to drive trial of Bing search and maps and increase their relevance with a young audience. At the same time, we knew that Jay-Z would soon be launching his autobiography, Decoded. With one big idea, we harnessed this epic moment in pop culture, connected our client to a new demographic, and gave millions a reason to use Bing. We started by putting every page of Jay-Z's book out in the world, every day for a month prior to the book's release. But the pages weren't just randomly placed. Every page's location was inspired by the story on each page, putting Jay-Z's entire biography in context. Fans could actually walk through Jay-Z's life right where it happened, finding pages in 13 major cities in the US and abroad, searching for everything from huge iconic billboards to unique collectible items. And if the media didn't exist near Jay-Z's life landmarks, we created it, taking the campaign to places money just can't buy. 
Gucci made custom jackets stitched with a page. A Cadillac wrapped with pages paid homage to the birthplace of New York hip hop. A page about Big Pimpin covered the bottom of the Delano pool. Even a bronze plaque was installed in the Marcy Projects, where Jay-Z spent his childhood. We let the story on each page determine each location. The unique pages covered hundreds of thousands of square miles. And as they were unveiled around the world, Bing tied every element of the campaign together with an integrated online game that directed fans to each page on the streets. Clues to the page locations were released daily through Facebook, Twitter, and radio. And every day for a month, millions of people gathered to solve the latest clues, guiding them to the exact street locations on Bing search and maps. Documenting and claiming the pages they found. The unique framework allowed anyone, anywhere, to walk the same streets and find a page. And over the course of the month-long campaign, they chased fame of their own, as they assembled the book digitally at bing.com slash jz before the hardcover hit stores. Every single piece of the campaign was woven together with Bing technology to allow fans to experience his story. Average player engagement on our website was over 11 minutes. Jay-Z's Facebook followers grew by 1 million. And Decoded hit the bestsellers list for 19 straight weeks. Decode Jay-Z's success was covered by every major news outlet, every major cultural influencer. Even other celebrities weighed in. Bing became part of the pop culture conversation. And in only one month, Bing saw an 11.7% increase in visits, hey. entering the global top 10 most visited sites for the first time, and earning 1.1 billion media impressions. Um, that's a case that I have to watch a lot because we present it a lot. But it's actually the reason I, w I left my old agency to come to Droga Five because I was I think, sat in a meeting room talking again about you know are we butterly delicious or deliciously butterly or you know are we refreshingly bright or you know some ridiculous conversation and then there's just people coming along and doing something very different like this, not selling at you, but achieving the business goal. The business goal was we want new users, new young people, and we achieved that 11.7% uplift. But we did it in a culturally resonant way. Um, how is time, Phil? We, I haven't got a watch on. Are we all right? You were good. Um, I'm going to show you another little video. Uh, it's again about sort of how to work with an artist. Have people heard of Rudimental, the music app? I don't know if they're known here. Yeah. Yes. Put hands up if you have. Because if you haven't, I'll explain them a bit more. Okay. So Rudimental are a hugely successful act in, in Britain and also in Australia, and I think starting to be in America and, and a lot of Central Europe. And Beats by Dre said, "We think they're going to win a Brit Award." We just want to film them like walking around Hackney, talking about Hackney. And we said, well, the problem with that is it doesn't really do a lot for you. It doesn't say anything about Beats. And it doesn't really say a lot about them, because most people know that Rudimental are from Hackney. So we said, but, back to my sort of Venn diagram, what is it you're trying to say, Beats? You're trying to say that we have these headphones that help you hear music as the artist intended, right? Then we talked to Rudimental. What are you trying to achieve? And they said, well, we wish people knew how much effort and layering went into our tracks. We wish people knew we're actually instrumentalists. Amir is a talented bass player. Kezi is a keyboard player. But people wouldn't know this because they're an electronic act. So again, we stick the two together. OK, we've got beats, music as the artist intended. Only with these headphones do you hear the whole sound. And then you've got rudimental saying, look, we're much we put so much blood, sweat, and tears into these tracks. We're 360 instrumentalists. And it's a first. And I'll apologize. The video on this we're going to redo. It's a bit fast, particularly if English isn't your first language. So if you don't get it, I'll explain it afterwards. Um, but this is what we did in one week. Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, two of the best music producers in the world, both frustrated by people using tiny earbuds with inferior sound both hell-bent on delivering music as the artist intended. Beats headphones let people enjoy the same sound quality producers have, as if they were right there in the mix and booth with them. But a lot of people just saw Beats as a fashion accessory. So when they decided to celebrate their relationship with Rudimental, one of the UK's top electronic music acts, we created a campaign that proved Beats' credentials. Beat by Beat was a unique YouTube experience, a first. An interactive film released on the day of Rudimental's big moment, the 2014 Brit Awards. A film that let people hear and control every element of Rudimental's latest hit, Powerless. The band told us how they worked together to make the song. As they did so, 
the viewer could use a YouTube page as a virtual mixing desk. Each video representing a different instrument, which could be turned on or off. Won't let me go. Six different videos working together seamlessly to reveal all the richness and detail below the surface of a song. We tweeted, we vined, we seeded the content around the first ever live YouTube broadcast of the awards. Three days later, we had 1.4 million views. A happy client, a happy band, and very happy fans who finally understood that Beats were the people to bring you music, as the artist intended. I think I'm losing my mind. So, in a week, we had to work with YouTube every other day to say, can we mess around with your interface? Because we fundamentally replaced what would normally be other people's videos with these pausable videos. And basically, you could mix the whole track. So you could take all of the layers out and just listen to the bass and listen to Piers talking about the bass. Or you could put the strings on and just hear the strings. And uh, the client, who is very hard to impress, sort of sent this big OMG email, lots of exclamation marks. And uh, 1.3 million views was over about two days. The other thing I'd say is, um, with culturally resonant ideas, is you have to be relentless. I remember sitting in a restaurant with friends, um, literally in contact with the band's management, Warner Music, and everyone trying to sort of coordinate all the tweets and vines and reactions on the night. So this stuff is actually a lot of hard work. And the Jay-Z Bing case study, I know, had people holed up in a room for about a month you know, ringing up Gucci or asking if they could change the lining of the Delano swimming pool. So I'd say that execution has to be impeccable. My final point is to take the luck out of fame. You know, you can build the best thing in the world, but no one can see it. 91% of brands last year invested in content. 91%. That to me means that content is the new clutter. Content's just like advertising. So to cut through, you really have to design fame into the idea. So have purpose, create a platform, talk to creators of culture, and partner with influencers if you think it's relevant. But then I always sort of make this analogy that you don't have to stick rockets on the idea to get it into orbit in the first place. You've got to design fame in. Be that using someone like Mark at the audience, be that through a viral seeding campaign. I won't disclose the number, but it's no secret really that Dove put a lot of money as well behind seeding the campaign as well as having a great idea. And I think those kind of rockets come in two forms, technological accelerators, like thunderclap, which is something we designed, or viral or seeding or using the audience. And then there's cultural acceleration. So always stick those rockets to ideas, because otherwise you can put it out and no one sees it. There's a lot of great ideas out there that have five views, because no one's put a PR plan around it. And we have comms planners in-house who relentlessly think about this stuff. So I'm going to show you two final videos, and then I'm done. And I promise the last one's funny, because my talk's far too serious compared to Mark. Um, this is for Honeymade. We sort of got to this brand purpose about wholesome American family values. Barack Obama actually commented on this ad as representing America today. But we knew that everyone would hate the ad. Not everyone, sorry. Lots of people would react to the ad because it dared to say that modern America includes mixed race families, same-sex couples, transgender parents. So we knew people would react and we designed the response before we aired the ad. All right, let's turn our attention to another TV surprise we were out in front of. This graham cracker commercial showing diverse families. Yeah, Honeymade has received um, a lot of praise, also mm -hmm. some hate mail for the ad, but now they've taken those negative responses and turned them into something incredibly positive. So we got the creative director behind the campaign and the gay dads in the commercial to talk about the company's brand new viral video. We were blown away. And so were we. Here's how Honeymade brilliantly responds to haters of their This Is Wholesome diverse family campaign. They took social media comments and asked artists to transform them into a beautiful sculpture. So Here are the negative paint. comments, and, and these are the overwhelmingly well. positive comments. I thought it was such a kind of a beautiful way to respond to that negativity. After the original commercial aired nearly one month ago, much of the negativity was directed towards married gay couple Jason Lyon and Tim Hartley. I think it's a new... Because of time, I'm going to skip there. But the point was, we knew people would react. And people went, this is terrible, this is outrageous, this doesn't represent America. But we'd already hired a warehouse and two artists. And we just printed out every single tweet of hate and turned it into a sculpture of love. The reason I want to skip on is I just want to show you one more. Because uh, I haven't made you laugh once. Uh, this is for Newcastle Brown Ale. Quick context, in America, beer advertising is all about overclaim. It, it sort of shows you perfect male models with their perfect female model girlfriends living their perfect lives and drinking beer, and it's all bollocks. And so the positioning for, no non uh, for, for Newcastle Brown is no bollocks. So we decided we want to call bollocks on the Super Bowl. And this is pretty much the last thing I'm going to say. I'm going to show you this one slide, then I'm going to get off. But this was our response to how do you get into the Super Bowl when you don't have enough money. 
Let's begin with Super Bowl 48. Super Bowl 48. The average 30 second spot's going for a whopping $4 million. $134,000 a second. The big game. The biggest marketing event in America. And an even bigger beer drinking event. Which is why Newcastle Brown Ale wanted to make a huge impact in the game. We just forgot one thing. We didn't have the money or the rights to be anywhere near the game. We couldn't even use the word s hole. But instead of sulking, we decided to call bollocks on the whole big game thing altogether, creating a campaign about the big game ad we would have made if we had the money. This is the story of the mega huge ad Newcastle would have made if we could have. We started just like any mega hype big game ad, releasing teasers and trailers for the ad we would have made. Battle apes, party sharks, friendship. Then we researched our concept with real focus groups and released a film with their real reactions. What do you think of Newcastle now? Feels a little desperate. This ad is pretty hilarious. This ad is not hilarious. Like what the hell's going on? And we revealed videos of the mega huge stars that would have been in our mega huge ad. Big game champion Keyshawn Johnson. And why would they even draw this up? An Academy Award nominated actress, Anna Kendrick. Newcastle Brown Ale, the only beer that ever promised me a high paying role in a commercial and then backed out at the last second like a bunch of we released a new piece each day in the 10 days before the game, and it took off. Anna Kendrick's not a Super Bowl spoof for Newcastle Ale also going viral. They wanted to make a commercial about how they couldn't afford to make a commercial. But it's spirited, it's spunky, yeah. I like it. Let's take a look at this uh, Newcastle ad. It's a fake Super Bowl spot that's never airing, that's online and all the prep that goes for it. So, I mean, there's a lot of back to it. It's really brilliant. And days before the game, as other brands released their big spots online, we released the mega cheap storyboard for the mega expensive ad we would have made. The power of partying destroys the robot like buff. Then came the game itself. We took advantage of the fact that most ads leaked days before the game, and we created even mega-er versions of other brands' big game day ads, and tweeted them out minutes after the real ads aired. In the end, we received 600 organic media placements, earning 10 million views in just two weeks, and over 1 billion total impressions. The commercial we would have made made nearly every major media outlet's big game top 10 list. The first time ever for a commercial that didn't actually run in the big game. And if that wasn't enough, it was the number one trending topic on Facebook for two days, ahead of even the big game itself, proving you don't have to be in the big game to win the big game. I mean, again, I can say it because I didn't work on it, but that just got out of the year in America, and in fact, the agency just got agency of the year. But um, I just love that, because they just trounced the people that had all the money by not making an ad. <laughs> Uh, and so, as I said, an ad can often be the answer, but very often it isn't if you want to go into culture. You've got to do something a bit more interesting. So my parting thoughts would be have purpose, speak to people in culture if you want to go into culture, consider partnering with influencers, and finally, take the luck out of fame. Don't leave it to chance. Thank you very much. <laughs>